Hello, this is Pastor Bella. Good evening, God girls, and welcome once again to the book of Revelation. We started with chapter 1 on Tuesday, and now we're heading into chapter 2. And there are just some things that I need to explain a little bit from chapter 1. Okay. In chapter 1, verse 4, it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. I've told you all before that I believe in the Trinity, that there is God the Father, God the Son, who's Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. I always let you all also know that I'm not a theologian. I'm not here to debate various theories about God and who God is and how he is and things like that because God is big. God is extremely powerful. He can do things that simply will blow your mind. The human mind cannot handle the magnificence of God. So God is three. God is one, and now you're also seeing that <laughs> God is seven, right? We have the seven spirits of God. So it makes you wonder, the Holy Spirit, how many Holy Spirits are there? Don't let the Bible confuse you. I teach the Bible simply. To me, the gospel is simple. It's simplified. Don't overthink anything. If any of you are confused about the number of God, if he's three, if he's one, if he's seven, if he's, don't even let it bug you. God is magnificent. Okay. But I wanted to talk about the seven spirits of God. Again, I'm telling you that God's number is seven. And you're seeing this over and over in the book of Revelation. I've told you several times, right? That God's number is seven. He created the world in seven days. Seven means perfection, completion. I mean, that is God's number. And we see it several times in the book of Revelation. So now we see the seven spirits of God before the throne. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The word of God is talking about Jesus right here. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's number one. The spirit of wisdom, number two, and understanding, number three. The spirit of counsel, number four. The spirit of might, number five. The spirit of knowledge, number six. And of the fear of the Lord, number seven. These right here, they are the seven spirits of God. <laughs> All right. So that's what I love about the Bible. It interprets itself. So the Holy Spirit has many components to him. And if you recall looking at the life of Jesus, Jesus was empowered for his ministry when the Holy Spirit came upon him. Not before. The Holy Spirit came upon him. You know that scripture that says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Yes, when the dove came, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus and he received the power. The spirit of the Lord rested upon him. He received the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. So, these are all components of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God the Father. He's the spirit of God the Son. So, again, don't get confused trying to do biblical mathematics. Don't get confused at all. God is awesome. God has many parts to him. But one thing I love about God and the Holy Spirit and God the Son is that they all work together. It's unity. It's love between all of them. They have their specific roles and it's unity. Remember in Genesis, let us make man in our own image. So they work together. It is seamless. There's no division between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, even though that there are more components to them. 
all right even with the way Jesus is described in the book of Revelation in the book of Daniel and how he actually was on earth how he evolves God is just so spectacular how he evolves and how things are always new with him so don't be, be be expecting God to appear to you in just a particular form there are many forms many components of God so I wanted to touch on this real quick in case you're wondering who are the seven spirits of God they're just all a component of the Holy Spirit and you can see that this was part of the power upon Jesus's ministry on earth he had all these components in him as he went about teaching and answering questions and performing miracles it's the Holy Spirit that empowered Christ and again it's the Holy Spirit that's empowering you and I in this dispensation all right so I wanted to touch on that real quick another thing I wanted to let you know is the book of Revelation is divided into three parts and we see that introduction chapter 1 sets the tone for everything chapter 1 verse 19 Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place. So, the things that he has seen is in chapter 1, his encounter with Christ, and that's the beginning of everything. Then write the things which are. And so now we're going into chapter 2, where Jesus has told Apostle John to write a letter to the seven churches. Again, the number seven. And I told you the churches in chapter 1, verse 11, which says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Okay, the seven churches, these are the things which are. This is what's happening currently in Apostle John's time. But the Bible is so powerful and symbolic. Do not think do not think that those churches are dead and gone and it was since it was these these are the things which are then that's it that's it was just that time no as i go ahead and tell you about each church i want you to open up your mind and think deeply look around you at the body of christ today because it is still happening right now there are various kinds of churches various kinds so as we go through each of the seven churches look out based on what you know of the body of Christ today of today's church look out and be sensitive and think deeply it'll also help you understand if you're in the right place because a Christian is supposed to be Christ-like. The root of Christianity is love. If you are in a church that has no love, you are in the wrong place. And you need to pray deeply to God if that's where he wants you to be. Because God sends us on various assignments. I'm not telling you that if your church is so bad, okay, you need to walk away. Some of you are on assignment, like Daniel was in Babylon. Babylon was his assignment. So before you start going to church, Pray, because God will send you to a church. And depending on what you see there, remember that you're a light to shine. God sends you there to be an influence. And when your time is up there, he'll move you out. But please, don't just go into churches by the flesh. You must pray to God to send you to a church. Don't just go, because that's how many Christians are in the wrong place. They're not being fed right. They're not being taught right. You need to be in a church that God has planted you in. So now, let's look at the characteristics of the seven churches. In Revelation chapter 2, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, remember in verse 20 of chapter 1, the Bible tells us that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. And that's even a very symbolic, right? To the angel of the church. The angels are not physical beings. They're spiritual beings. 
they are messengers of God. So that should let you know that did Apostle John actually write to an angel to take a letter to the church? This is very, very symbolic. This means that this is a spiritual thing. And spiritual things, it's still happening right now. It's not just for that period. Just like when you read the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament and you look at the things that they went through. Are you not experiencing some of those things today? So when you read the Bible, don't just think it's a book of the past. It is very, very present. All right. So continuing with chapter two, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So, this church right here is the church of Ephesus. Ephesus means desirable. This church is as it was in the beginning. Okay? This was how it was when Jesus handed over the church to Peter to continue from where he left off. And that's why it says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. And so when you see today, so when you see today in today's church, many Ministers who get ahead of themselves thinking that the church belongs to them. Pride. Remember when God's word says that he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Many ministers of God are proud. They have lost sight of what the great commission is. And they want their church to be the end all be all. Forgetting that Jesus is the head of the church. Many ministers of God are full of pride, the way they carry themselves, the way they make themselves unapproachable. A pastor is a shepherd. You must be available to your people. People should be able to access you. There are many shepherds that can't be accessed. They've become so big now. You have to, you know, go through, jump through the hoop in, a, in, a, in order to see your pastor. Shouldn't be that way. A pastor should be accessible. And of course, if the ministry is very large, he should have a pastoral team, you know, or she should have a pastoral team to be able to help the sheep. The sheep must be helped. Your concerns must be met. All right. So Jesus is the head of the church. That's who he is. And when Jesus was still on the earth, he was there encouraging, admonishing, reproving, correcting, and guiding. The church then was walked in separation from the world. And this is what is desirable to God. We must be separate from the world. We cannot be doing what the world is doing. We cannot be worldly. We cannot be what the Bible calls carnally minded, where your mind is just set on things of this earth. You're not keeping eternity in perspective or the kingdom of God in perspective or the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. It's just full of worldliness, okay? So this church seemed to be the ideal church from the beginning because Jesus had set the right foundation. He taught them right. They knew what to do. And this was, Ephesus was the desirable. And 
You see that Ephesus is commended for its labor, patient endurance, and spiritual discernment. But there was something there which we need to be aware of today. In verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. The Christian walk, you must examine your life daily. You must check yourself. Are you still connected to God? The easiest way to get far away from God is when you stop spending time with Him. When you wake up in the morning and you just go about your day, you don't have your daily quiet time, your Bible study time, your praying time with God, you are going to get disconnected from God real fast. It's so easy. Another easy way to get disconnected from God are the people you surround yourself with. When you're around people who don't take their faith in God seriously, or when you're around unbelievers, they take your attention away from God. God is our first love as a Christian. Your first love is God. He must have your focus. He must have your attention. If any of you have ever been in love, you should know what I'm talking about. When you're in love, that person is your priority. That's your attention. That's your heartbeat, your focus, your everything, right? That's who God is supposed to be to us. He is our first love. Mark 12, 30 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. It's an all-consuming love. But the church in Ephesus, they had forgotten their first love. So it starts to unravel. It starts to unravel where the flesh and the spirit are in a constant, constant battle. Apostle Paul discusses this in Galatians. The flesh and the spirit is a battle till you die. This body right here is prone to sin and sinful ways. So it's a constant struggle when a Christian is supposed to be of the spirit and doing things that glorify God. The flesh is in contradiction. The flesh just wants to take care of what it desires, fleshly lusts and things like that, which are contrary to the kingdom of God. So it is a battle. And your flesh is interested in a whole bunch of other stuff other than your first love. So you really have to discipline your flesh. You have to make up your mind that daily I will spend time with God. Daily I will stand up for God. Just like Daniel did. Daniel had a strong relationship with God. And that's what preserved his life. That's what preserved his ministry. I don't care how anointed and gifted you are. If you do not spend time with God, the one who gave you that gift and that anointing, you will fall by the wayside right quick. The devil is the enemy of God and he's coming against you each and every day. He's coming against us as Christians to forget our first love. He distracts us with temptations. He distracts us with problems. Another thing that can distract you from God is your problem. Some people get into a trial and it's like, I can't go to church right now. I need to figure out this trial. And that's what starts to happen. Your spiritual life starts to unravel. You're now so consumed with your problem or the trial you're going through, that you forget to relate with the one who can get you out of that trial. That's why I've told you all several times that when you're going through a trial, you must hide yourself deeper in God. It's not the time to run away from God. This is the time to run to God more than ever because he's the one that can get you out of your trial. Okay? So there's so many ways you can forget your first love. Temptation. Oh, temptation is a primary way the enemy uses to get us away from God. So if it's not a trial, it's a temptation. So make sure you work on your relationship every day with God. Just as I said, when you're in love with somebody, every day you're talking to that person. Every day you can see that person. You want to see that person. Every day you want to hang out with that person. Remember that God is your first love. Jesus who left his throne in heaven to die for you and I. He is your first love because it is love that propelled him to leave his throne in heaven, to come and die for lesser beings. 
like you and I. He spent 33 and a half years on this earth. I don't know about you all, but that's not an easy thing to do. When you're used to finery and royalty and you want to come down here and be a carpenter's son born in a manger. Look, Jesus sacrificed a lot for you and I. And it only makes sense for us to do the same thing. Of course, I'm not saying that we can ever sacrifice as much as Christ did. But we need to take our relationship with God seriously. We must love him. We must love him. And the enemy is fighting the love that we have for God. And he's fighting the love we're supposed to have for each other in the church. You need to be aware of the tactics of the enemy. All right? So... Jesus goes on to say that the church in Ephesus should repent. If not, he's going to remove the lampstand from its place. The lampstand, as I've told you all before, and as Revelation told you in chapter 1, is the church. He's going to remove the church from its place. Isn't that scary? Hmm. Your relationship with God... Don't take it like it's nothing. Your relationship with God is very, very, very important. Very important. Don't let, don't lose your place in Christianity. Don't lose your place in the church. Don't displease God. Don't fall out of favor with God. We saw that with King Saul and so many people in the Bible. Don't let God turn his back on you to remove you from your place. And that's why when I see a lot of ministers of God or even Christians who are so gifted, but yet they're messing around. They don't have righteous characters. They're preaching one thing in church and living a very wayward life. It's because they don't fear God. They don't fear the judgment of God. God will remove such people from their place. When you read Matthew chapter 7, when I went over that with you, oh, <laughs> don't mess with God because that chapter shows clearly that there are Christians who will go to hell. So there's a crazy doctrine out there that says once saved, always saved. In fact, someone contacted me on Facebook recently and was asking me, uh, ma'am, what's your, what's your uh, standing on eternal security? Is it once saved, always saved? I said, you know what? I'm going to tag you on a post. Uh, that shows my stance on this. I don't believe in one saved, always saved. How can you read the Bible and believe in one saved, always saved? When God keeps talking about righteousness and holiness and obedience and how if we're not such people, we fall out of favor, out of his favor. If we're not such people, we end up in hell. How can you tell me once saved, always saved? Which means that once you give your life to Christ, which is in quotes, because if you give your life to Christ and you're still walking around living a sinful life, you have not given your life to Christ. Did you catch that? If you say you have given your life to Christ and you're still walking around living a sinful life, living a life that's against everything Jesus has said in his word, everything that Jesus stands against, you have not given your life to Christ. You are just pretending, you're just fooling yourself. Surrender yourself to Jesus. Surrender every part of you to Jesus. Every part. Your thoughts, your heart, your body. Surrender it to God. Where you're now doing what God has told you to do. You're not doing things just by your own will anymore. All right? So, first love. We need to take our first love seriously. You cannot say that I've given my life to Christ or I've come out for the altar call and I'm now a Christian. And then just as you do that, you can go on and live a sinful life and expect that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Oh, Revelation is going to make it clear. Those who are going to heaven. I'm so glad we're in this book. Because when we were going through the book of Exodus, I told you that if you don't fear God, when we're done with this book, you're going to fear God. I told you the same thing in the book of Daniel, because a lot of Christians don't have the fear of God. And that's why they're messing around. If you fear God, you will think, <laughs> not even twice, you will think 10 times before you do something that's wrong. 
I'm telling you, because when you keep your eternity in perspective, that this decision I'm about to make is either going to lead me to heaven or hell. When you think about that before you do anything, you will behave perfectly. You will behave rightly. But a lot of Christians don't have the fear of God. They just live it in sin and they think, okay, when I die, I'm going to heaven. You are not going to heaven if you do not live a life that pleases God. And sin does not please God. Look at what Jesus is saying to the church of Ephesus. Look at what he's saying. If they do not repent, he will remove them from their place. Jesus says in his word, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So when you sin against God, it means that you do not love him. The church in Ephesus has left their first love. That means they're now doing things that God does not approve of. Christians, God girls, check yourselves. Check your life. Is your life pleasing God? There is no excuse. Don't say, oh, because other Christians or other people are doing this, it must be right. If it does not line up with the word of God, do not do it. Because the book of Revelation is going to show you who will make heaven and who will end up in hell. And it is so easy. Listen to me. It is so easy to go to hell. It is so easy, y'all. Very, very easy. So don't mess around with Jesus. Check yourself if you still love him. Check yourself. Because if you love Jesus, you will obey him. Obeying him will not be a chore. It won't be, oh, I have to do this because yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, that's religion. Religion keeps you in bondage where you're just doing things, but you're not doing it from your heart. You're just going to church, but you really don't want to go to church. You think God can't see that? You should want to go to church because you're in love with God, because you're excited to go there. Don't just be going to church because it's expected. I'm a Christian. I need to go to church. And there are so many Christians like that. So as we go through the seven churches, you need to realize the kind of Christian you want to be. You need to make up your mind the kind of Christian you want to be. Because a lot of these churches, they're in trouble with Jesus. You're going to see the imperfections in these seven churches. Well, there's one of them that's good. All right? You're going to see imperfections. Okay? So, that's the church of Ephesus. Now, verse 6 talks about but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I want to tell you a little bit about the Nicolaitans. And what I love about that statement is the church of Ephesus hates what Jesus hates. Sin is not of God. If you love committing sin, then there's something wrong with you as a Christian. When you give your life to Christ... He changes you, and I've told you it's not overnight. There are just some things, if you look back, based on your Christian walk, if you look back at when you started um, with your walk with God, you'll see how the Holy Spirit has changed. The Holy Spirit changes. He's a Holy Spirit. Get that. He is a Holy Spirit. Holiness is of Him. So if you're doing things that are not holy, the Holy Spirit will start to change you from within. That's if you're a surrendered child of God. If you're not surrendered to God, you're not going to let the power of the Holy Spirit work in you. A lot of people are running away from the voice of God. God is letting you know this is wrong. This is not the right thing to do. But then you're trying to shut that voice out. Okay? But if you're surrendered, you're not going to shut that voice out. You're going to listen to that voice and thank Him daily for His help and live to please Him. The Holy Spirit is a purifier. He's going to start separating you from an impure life. I'm telling you, he's going to change your life. So check yourself. Are you the same Christian you were before? Or are you changing? Are you growing? Are you getting closer to God? Because the closer you get to God, the farther away you're going to be from the things of the world. Because I've told you several times, worldliness is abnormal to godliness. You can't love God and love the things of the world. You can't. It's so different. The holiness of God cannot get along with the carnality of the world. You can't serve two masters. Either you're serving God who's holy and righteous, or you're serving the devil who's of the world, who is not holy. He's not righteous. He just wants to do 
bad, crazy, wacky stuff. So you cannot be a Christian who is doing worldly things. No, no, it's wrong to do so. Nicolaitans, they're followers of a heretic called Nicholas. A heretic is, when they say you're heretical, it means you are talking about beliefs that are not of God. Okay, that are against the religion. You know, Christianity is classified as a religion, but the deeper you get into God, you see it's it's beyond a religion. You can't even classify Christianity as a religion. It is a relationship because Jesus takes over your life and you are so happy that he takes over your life. He gives you his peace. Religion, there's no peace in religion. You can't, no, relationship, the love that you feel from Jesus, yes, that's true Christianity, okay? So these are people who who practice and are taught impure and immoral doctrines. Example given is such as the community of wives that committing adultery and fornication was not sinful and that eating meats offered to idols was lawful. And when we get to the church of Thyatira, you see that this is similar to the doctrines of Balaam and Jezebel in the church of Thyatira. So, Jesus is happy that those in Ephesus hate the Nicolaitans because they're false. False, false ministers, false Christians who are making it clear that it's okay to fornicate, it's okay to commit adultery, it's okay to eat the meats offered to the idols, which, again, was the issue that Daniel had in Babylon. He could not eat the meat of King Nebuchadnezzar. Those meats were offered to the idols. He did not want to defile himself. So a Nicolaitan is very dangerous. And, I mean, look at the characteristic. Don't you see that there are some Christians like that today? They know the word. I mean, they can uh, teach the word. They can raise their hands all holy in church, but then they justify sin. They say, it's okay, God understands, you know, you've been single forever, you're a sexual being, so you need to be having sex if you're not married. God understands. I uh, no, that's evil. That's a Nicolation. Anyone that's trying to get you to disobey God and justify sin is a Nicolation in today's church. Those Christians that are living sinful lives and making it seem that it's okay, that's a Nicolation. And what does Jesus say about a Nicolation? But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolations, which I also hate. So be careful of worldly, carnal Christians. That behavior is hated by God, and you do not want God to hate you. So you need to pick which side that you're on. You need to pick the side. Are you a Nicolation who's heretical? who's sinful, pretending to be a Christian, but doing some crazy stuff? Or are you truly a God girl? Are you truly a child of God? Are you truly a part of that desirable church of what the church was supposed to be as Jesus left it before he went back to heaven? The church, the church, the desirable church of God, looking at the characteristics of the church of Ephesus. Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him who overcomes. To him who overcomes. Christianity is a race. You have to stand righteous to the very end. You have to stand righteous to the very, very end. You cannot let anything affect your relationship with Jesus. You cannot let anything affect your love of God. There are people you have to separate from. There are things you have to separate from that are distracting you from God. Be careful. This church still exists today. This church that has forgotten the first love of God. Jesus is your first love. On the outset, they have the characteristics. They have labored for Jesus. They have not become weary. 
persevered, they've had patience, but this is what Jesus has against them. You have left your first love. Some of us get so busy in church. We're so busy. Busy being in the choir. Busy on the prayer team. Busy being an usher. Busy doing this. Busy doing that. But when we get home, we don't have a relationship with Jesus. And that's very dangerous. It's not about staying out there being busy and being a cool Christian. And no, when you get back home, do you have your quiet time with Jesus? Are you putting your ear to him? Listening for instruction. Listening to him. Jesus, guide me. Jesus, let me know what's next. Jesus, keep me in you. Jesus, have mercy upon me. Are you walking in step with God or you're walking ahead of him? Check yourself, God girl. Check yourself. Check yourself. If Jesus is your love Jesus needs to be your love. Jesus needs to be your love as a God girl. He needs to be your first love. He needs to be the one that you're excited about to meet with daily and be with him. Remember when we were in the book of Exodus, look at how much time Moses spent with God. He was spending a lot of time with God, being in the presence of God. It is so important. It's not about being busy for God. Every church activity, you're here, you're there on the outset. You look like a good Christian. You're kind, you're wonderful. But when you get home, you don't have time to spend time with God. When you get home, you're still doing your own thing. You're still living your life. You're thinking that, okay, that's just home and work. You know how we, some of us work so hard at work. <laughs> and then when we get home, we start our home life. Of course, some people bring their work home with them. And that's Christianity. You don't leave your work at church. <laughs> All right. You don't leave your Christianity at church. You take it home with you. As a Christian, you take your work home with you. You must still be a Christian when you get home. Christianity is not just about going to church and doing church activities. When you get home, are you a Christian in your home? Can your people look at you and say, this is a child of God? At home, there's so many Christians that have perfected being Christians in church. But once they get home, there's someone else entirely. Don't be that Christian. Take your work home with you. Take your Christianity home with you. Don't live two separate lives. Being surrendered to Jesus means every part of your life is surrendered to him. The part that works in church for him and the part that is at home, away from church, must be surrendered to Jesus. You must have a relationship with Jesus, a strong relationship. And your relationship is strong when you spend time with him every day. Read his word every day. I spoke to a God girl recently because I noticed that a lot of Christians struggle with reading the Bible. A lot of Christians, they struggle with reading the Bible. And I told her this. I said, look, this is what I'm going to tell you. You hear it all the time. Read your Bible every day. But this is what I'm going to tell you. Read a verse of the Bible every day. And when I'm telling you read a verse of the Bible, I'm not just saying uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believeth in him will not perish or have everlasting life and close your Bible, boop, and then you go about your day. No, read that verse. Meditate on that verse. Before you know it, you'll go from that verse to reading the chapter because you want to get deeper into the verse. And then you go into the chapter, it's not enough for you. Before you know it, you end up reading two, three chapters in the book. You end up reading a whole book of the Bible. So that's my challenge to you. Read a verse of the Bible every day. Meditate on it. Do that. Don't be overwhelmed that, oh, I need to read the whole Bible or read. No, just read a verse. And anytime you're going to read the Bible, pray first and say, Holy Spirit, I have no ability to understand your word. You're the one with the ability. So give me the ability to help me understand what I'm about to read. Give me the grace to apply it in my life. Because reading it is not, it's not only the completion of it. You must apply the word of God in your life. Even after you close the book of the Bible, you must still be operating the word of God in your life. Okay? So you pray, you read that verse, and then before you know it, 
the hunger will come upon you to read more verses, to read the whole chapter. Before you know, you finish the whole book of the Bible, make sure you read a verse of the Bible daily. Make sure you talk to God daily. Tell him what's on your heart. Prayer is not rigid. Don't make prayer to be something rigid that's not fun. It's just a conversation with God. You praise him. You worship him. You thank him for what he's done for you, what he's doing for you, and the things he's not even done yet. Just be grateful for life. And then start telling him things that are in your heart. Pray for other Christians. Pray for the body of Christ, especially as we're going through the seven churches. You, need, you, you know that the body of Christ needs prayers. So God, girls, I have to stop here right now. Yes. I have to stop here right now. We're going to take our time with the book of Revelation. We're going to take our time with this book so that you can understand what Jesus expects from us in preparation for his coming. God loves you and I love you. This is Pastor Bella, Ultimate God Girl. God bless you.